Thank you for that. And uh, up next, we have uh, Janine. Janine, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Janine. Hello. Hi, how are you? Um, thank you very much for this um, talk on conservative treatment. I really appreciate that. Um, my question is, um, you, you talked about people with chronic pain and then regression back to the mean. Is, is that my correct understanding? And so yeah. I'm wondering how with conditions like um, chronic bursitis and inflamed tendons and rotator cuff, do you agree with, um, you know, the guided steroid injections or how would you um, manage a condition like that where, where pain is pretty much constant and obviously it must be related to osteoarthritis, but how would you encourage patients to manage that? And do you agree with the steroid injections? Yeah, so, uh, so good question, but probably a couple of, couple of answers to that because you covered a few things. Um, the, uh, so if you have an inflammatory condition, um, then having an anti-inflammatory injected uh, can be helpful, uh, but it's a temporary help. Um, it can last, and a lot of the studies that show uh, effectiveness, it's measured in weeks, you know, sort of two to eight weeks. So uh, yes, if you have an inflammatory condition, uh, an injection can be a temporary help. It won't reverse the course of the condition. It doesn't. It doesn't change the underlying pathology, uh, um, and it certainly doesn't doesn't reverse degenerative conditions. However, some of the things you mentioned are self-limiting. So uh, a lot of the things we have, like uh, rotator cuff uh, inflammation in the shoulder, uh, tennis elbow is a classic. Uh, you know, it's a very painful condition. I've had it myself. I even put myself in a placebo study where they injected me with, with uh, something, and I don't know what it was. Um, and uh, I didn't get better. Um, but a lot of these things are self-limiting. So I've, I've had uh, shoulder problems. I've had uh, tennis elbow problems. But we know it's not just me personally. We know from studies, for example, tennis elbow, after 12 months, 98% of people will be resolved regardless of what you do to them. So a lot of these things, when you say it's chronic and it never gets better, they do. A lot of these things are self-limiting. Rotator cuff, we know that most people will improve. I think that in six months, 40% of people will improve if they have rotator cuff pathology and associated pain. So a lot of these things improve over time. Um, now, some things don't and some things gradually progress. So, you know, osteoarthritis of the, of the hip, um, you know, it can fluctuate, sure, and people can regress to the mean, but by and large, it, it does tend to progress over decades and you get to the stage where you're in terrible pain and you can't walk. Well, then, yeah, then you need, you need something done. Uh, I don't think an injection is going to cut it then. I think then you need to have a, 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 a hip replacement. Uh, if you end up with osteoarthritis secondary to a rotator cuff tear in your shoulder, you can end up with terrible pain and stiffness that can be freed up with a shoulder replacement where you can get much more movement back and, and a lot less pain. Um, but uh, yeah, but injections, they're not that helpful. They give you at best temporary relief. And when you inject steroids into things, it can make the, the uh, tendons degenerate more and it can increase your risk of infection and in fact there's been lots of studies now to show that if you have a joint replacement you've had a steroid injection in that joint within the last six months you're more likely to have an infection in the joint replacement. Ian thank you and let's uh, move forward now with Shannon she's got a question if you can go ahead and unmute yourself Shannon. Hi Shannon you're able to unmute yourself. Okay can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Harris. Um, you mentioned a lot of ineffective surgeries, but you say you're still operating. So I wanted to know what are some effective surgeries that you would say they're currently doing? And um, C-sections seem to be very common nowadays. And when I ask women who I know who are having them, why they're having them, it's just kind of the answer is the doctor just says, I'm high risk or like there doesn't seem to be any basis. So I wanted yeah. to know what's your opinion on those as well. And then also just how do we contact you? Yeah. As far as okay. like social media or stuff like that. Yeah. Um, all right. So again, uh, a few answers. Contacting me is pretty easy. You can only find me on the internet. Um, and, uh, and I'm on Twitter at a couple of things. One is at Dr. Doubter. 
um, one word uh, and uh, a blog that I used to have, I don't feel it much anymore, called Dr. Skeptic, and also on Twitter at Dr. Ian Harris, so D-R-I-A-N-H-A-R-R-I-S. Um, and uh, you can you can find my email. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's one thing. And I've got an email at UNSW, which is my university, which is basically just Ian Harris at UNSW.edu.au. Now, your question is, what is effective and what about C-section? So I do cover cesarean sections a lot in the book, uh, and we're actually covering it again in the, in the new book that's coming out because they're overdone. They're definitely overdone. In some parts of China and in Brazil, the cesarean section rates are 50%. Uh, in uh, the US and Australia, they're both the same. It's about 30%. There's no way that cesarean section rates should be 30%. There's no way that the, the body is designed in a way that um, it only gives birth properly 70% of the time. You know, they, these are way overdone. Uh, the World Health Organization has tried to put uh, accurate numbers on, on what the C-section rate should be. Uh, they got shouted down when they said around 10 or 15% and they had to raise that. Um, but uh, certainly a lot of the reasons is uh, medical legal. And if you speak to um, the doctors who do this, you know, they say basically this is, this is covering uh, covering us because uh, you know we 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 don't want to get sued. I noticed a comment there: induction of labour. I cover that as well. Induction of labour is way overdone, um, uh, and in fact, uh, if you have an induced labour, you're more likely to have a C-section. Um, so it's just you know one thing, one medical intervention leads to another. Uh, they're definitely they're definitely overdone. Uh, do they have a place uh, for sure? You know, they're, they're, there's there's got to be examples where you know it's it's life or death, and a C-section can can save the baby um, um, uh, and the mother. You know, uh, so I have no doubt about that. But thirty percent of the time, I don't think so. Um, and. Uh, um, the other question was what operations are effective. Um, so there's plenty of operations that are effective. Uh, um, I think uh, it's good for me to list them sometimes because it gets away from this message that, that I, you know, I'm saying all surgery doesn't work. I operate my specialties in, in fractures. Um, so for example, very common fractures I treat are hip fractures in the, in, in the elderly. We know that if we don't treat them with surgery, it's very difficult for them to walk afterwards Then often the bone doesn't heal. Um, if we do an operation that replaces the broken part with a metal part, they can walk on it the next day and, and have their mobility restored. You know, it's, and in fact, hip replacement in general for osteoarthritis is considered to be a very effective uh, operation. Um, but outside my own field, there's a lot of effective operations. I mentioned them in the panel I did the other day. So for example, there's been studies showing that kidney transplant uh, is much more cost effective and much better for quality of life for patients compared to ongoing hemodialysis. So if you have failed kidneys, um, being strapped to a dialysis machine for three days a week is no fun. Uh, having a successful renal transplant can basically restore you to normal life almost. Uh, so that's a very good procedure. And one of the most cost-effective procedures in the world is actually cataract surgery, um, where in, in developing countries, you can get cataract lenses, you can buy them for a few dollars. I think they're like $25. Um, and it doesn't take much to put them in. Um, and, uh, and you can restore the sight of somebody who has cataracts. You know, so there's, there's a whole heap of procedures. Uh, some cancer uh, uh, surgeries uh, can be very effective. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots out there. So don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, but even the effective operations are overdone. You know, uh, I think knee replacement, for example, is probably a little bit overdone. Uh, there's a lot of variation between countries. Uh, the US has the highest rates of almost any operation you can think of. Um, it really is crazy over there. Um, it's, it, the medical system is profit driven over there uh, and it's all about turnover. It's all about maximizing health care, not maximizing health. Uh, the more operations you do, the more money you make. Uh, and you compare it to a system like in Canada or the UK, where doctors don't get paid to do procedures, they could just get a salary. And you look at the rate, I think the rate of uh, spine fusion per 100,000 population is something like nearly 10 times higher in the US than it is in the UK, and where you'd have, you'd think you'd have a similar, similar population. So that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, 
so yeah, there's a lot of effective operations, but some of them are being overdone. Great, got time for one more? Yeah. Great, well, uh, let's go ahead and take uh, Steve. Steve, if you go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi there, um, yeah, so I've got a question. It's kind of like a follow on from what you mentioned earlier um, in relation to examinations, but this time I want to ask you a question in relation to um, how it is that you can make examinations so that not so many surgeries come out of them. Do you mean examinations or tests? Test, yeah, test, yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so there's a couple of things that, that people are looking at in this area. So the first thing that I've already mentioned is not to do so many tests. So, so when somebody, uh, you know, has a bit of back pain or, or a bit of knee pain and, uh, you know, they don't need to have an MRI scan because uh, they'll probably just get better. Um, and uh, so the first thing is to not do the test in the first place. But there's other interesting areas of research. And one is how the tests are reported. Now, if you look at the results of any MRI scan of a spine, you'll often see like a two page report listing, you know, uh, numerous things that are found there. It just sounds terrible. And for an uninformed patient, they're reading all of these, you know, list of things that are wrong with them. Uh, it's going to scare the hell out of them. And um, uh, it's, it's not helpful. And, and most of those things are sort of normal age related changes that are not associated with pain or, or, or any problems. They're just pointing them out. Um, and some of them are so microscopic that, you know, we only picked them up on MRI scans. We didn't even know they existed before, um, but they're all there in the report. So there's some interesting trials being done comparing. And the reason, the reason why they do that is because they want to cover themselves. The rule in radiology practice is to report absolutely everything you see or you even think you see. You just report everything. Then no one can come back to you and say you didn't pick it up. Um, but they don't realize the problems with that. Um, and so there's some studies where we're looking at um, reporting the usual way or writing an MRI report that says um, no changes beyond the usual age-related changes were found. No, no unexpected abnormality, like a, a, you know, a one-line report, which is really saying the same thing. And it's going to be interesting to see whether that leads to less uh, invasive treatment afterwards. Um, but there's certainly a problem with doing too many investigations, that's for sure. But there's also a problem with the way they are being reported and interpreted by patients and doctors.